Well met, traveller. Join me by yonder fire and rest ye weary gams. Welcome to Shut Up and Sit Down's review of Descent Legends in the Dark, sent to us by board game publishers Asmo Day. A box so gorgeous as to make you realize that packaging design is not usually the industry's strong suit. And actually, it might be nice if our collections didn't look like a clutch of destitute logos organized a flash mob. But what is in this box? Hark, allow me to excrete but a simple cantrip. Ah. How marvelous! But actually, I have one more magic spell for you. Hi, I'm Quinns, and I'm actually not a wizard at all. I'm sorry, I would have loved to have kept that going, but I don't know if you've ever worn a fake beard. It's kind of like wearing the pubics of another dirtier man. So Descent is back, and Shut Up and Sit Down has something of a history of this game. The first ever edition of Descent was one of the things that got me into board games. That game came in what was lovingly referred to back then as a coffin box, and reimagined the humble dungeon crawl as something with the hustle and energy of American gladiators. Then came Descent 2nd edition. A hunky upgrade, which let a team of heroes take on an Overlord player in a dramatic campaign that started strong but inevitably became unbalanced as players gorged themselves on an entire catalogue of game-breaking powers and items. But this lovely new box is not calling itself a third edition, which is perhaps your first hint that it's trying something different and ambitious. You see, gone is Descent's traditional all versus one structure that sees a team of hero players taking on an overlord player who is trying their absolute hardest to inflict an unhappy ending on the fantasy realm of Terenoth like a sociopathic dungeon master. Legends in the Dark is now an entirely cooperative experience where one to four players take on man's natural enemy. Phones. So, as you play Legends in the Dark's campaign, which is the only way you can play it, your team of players will be tackling missions where the game's companion app only reveals each new room as you enter it, the scenario being dolloped onto the table like thick, anticipatory honey dripping off a digital spoon. The app will also tell you how to imagine each room, using a technology known as words. It tells you what all of the monsters do on their turn. It tells you what happens when you hit them. It tracks their health. It shows your characters talking to one another. Then, when the mission's over, it shows your characters traveling back to town. It tells you what random encounters they have. Then when you're in town, the app will track your group's loot and recipes. And you can use your loot to craft stuff. And it tracks your gold so you can buy things and then you can tell it you've equipped those things. So later when you tell it that you've walloped a monster in its gross little mouth, it can be like, hey, that thing you equipped just did a thing also as well. So how do you play? Well, you... Oh, oh I, uh, excuse me, everybody. It sounds like we're getting a public service announcement through from Fantasy Game Reviewer Headquarters. Oh, yeah, okay, of course. Don't play this game on a phone! Listen, when you start the campaign, you're gonna have to download the app on something, whether that's your phone or a laptop or tablet or PC, and that's gonna feel like an inconsequential decision. It is not! There is no transferring of your save game, so the only way that you can play on a different device is by sitting there with a the different device, idly fingering your way through the early missions, kind of faking your progress until you arrive at a game state that's kind of sort of what you had before, maybe. And listen, playing Legends in the Dark on a phone is as obnoxious as the rest of the box is charming. You're gonna have to drag tiny icons to other tiny icons every time someone hits a monster. Only one person can see the instructions of how to set up each new room and they're gonna seem like they're performing obsessive feng shui for a doll's house. There are really long cutscenes multiple times per mission that one person is gonna have to read out as if they were performing the world's most underfunded play. We've nearly made it, Indris. Tomorrow we'll be in Frostgate, and then we can send our letter to- is this guy talking? Then we can send our letter to the Baroness. Can you tell I played this game on a phone? Listen, if you do not have a laptop or tablet, there is no way this game is worth your money. And with that, caveat- caveated, 
back to you in the studio. Thanks, Quince. So how do you play? Well, let's imagine you've got the game set up, you've got your friends over, you've had a weirdly chill and mindful time assembling all of this 3D terrain, and you bear your party's magic item, the screen of attention deficit disorder plus one. The campaign starts with a camp of handsome travellers who, spoilers, will soon become fast friends, resting for the evening next to a watchtower. But oh no! In your first scenario, the watchtower comes under attack by evil bad guys, and you jump to their rescue, and so begins a grand adventure that will take you into bogs, towers, mines, anywhere where there are evil guys to slay, you can expect to go there and slay the pants off them. More mechanically, when you're actually in scenarios and, you know, playing the game, on your turn, your hero will get a small handful of movement points that they can use to run around, and they get exactly two actions. And you can use these results to get more movement points, but generally, you'll be using the actions on your turn to either attack a monster, at which point you roll a dice and punch the results you got into the app, or you'll interact with a piece of scenery. And this interacting you're gonna be doing with all this lovely 3D scenery is unquestionably one of the most innovative and entertaining parts of Legends in the Dark. Although it does turn your party of heroes into like a group of prospective homeowners, walking through every scenario, looking and rubbing and smelling and touching every single piece of furniture that they come across. Is there a table in the room? Go and have a rummage. Is there a chest? You better believe that's getting rummaged. We found a tree. Can you rummage a tree? Cause we're gonna find out. Oh my God, there are three options when rummaging a tree. I'm gonna leave my character here for as many turns as it takes to try all of them. A lot of these interactions with scenery will advance the story in the scenario you're playing. Some will see you finding physical cards for your characters, but tons of your interactions with scenery will see your party finding crafting components in a compulsive mechanic that has been present in video games for ages, but has now found board games and slipped right in like a fox into a hen house that even by hen house standards really thought it was safe from the fox. Touch a tree. 14 herbs and two discrete units of life magic will slough off it like skin from a boiled tomato. Look at a shelf in the middle of a fight? Just as well, it's dangerous to go alone. Take these seven curios and eight rolls of cloth. Did you just kill a man? If you're lucky, he might leave behind as many as 10 bones for you to pick up off the ground as if you were the world's least efficient mugger. In this version of Descent, enemies are way more dangerous and the game resides less in the grid in the middle and more in the indulgent array of skills and items and abilities that you're gonna steadily amass as the campaign goes on. Inscrutable machinery that each player is gonna be hyper fixating on and flipping and tweaking and using like a dungeon based DJ. In Legends in the Dark, when you're attacking or defending or doing a skill check, these symbols on the dice are successes, and these symbols count as successes only if you're willing to collect fatigue tokens. And for as long as I've played Descent, I've always thought of these little teardrop fatigue tokens as sweat, and all the heroes in Descent are just incredibly sweaty, and now I want you to think of it that way as well. And now your character weapons and skills all have individual limits of how much sweat they can hold, as well as sweaty abilities that you can trigger if the card isn't yet totally damp. Also new to this version, if your hero collects statuses like they're scared or poisoned or prepared, those tokens go on individual cards. And any player can spend one of their two actions on their turn flipping any card which gets rid of all the tokens on it and reveals a new skill or weapon on the other side. So you might charge into a swamp, which poisons you, kill an enemy with your mirror blades, and then utilize the prepare token you had to flip that card for free, getting rid of the fatigue and the poison before firing your bow at the next enemy. Does that sound cool? Cause I mean, I think it is. And once you've found the right difficulty setting for your group, which thankfully can be changed mid campaign, you can also look forward to a game that is excellently tense because healing is scarce. And if any one player loses all of their health, everybody loses. And then you get to watch my favorite thing in this whole game, a cutscene where all of the characters discuss what went wrong, like sulking teammates in a sports anime, consoling one another in the locker room after losing a match. And on that note, listen, Fantasy Flight has made countless games set in their proprietary fantasy Terranoth universe. Look, this is the lore guide. And I have played more of these games than anyone should have to. If you held a Geiger counter next to me, I think it would pick up dangerously unsafe levels of Uthuks and Yinfernals. 
Now, Terranoth has never been interesting. But in this game, while it's still kind of generic, the creators have at least rolled up their sleeves and applied some of the desperately needed modern thinking you might associate from an episode of Queer Eye. The heroes you play have actual personalities. The random encounters are entertaining. Terranoth has never felt more like an intellectual property that maybe might possibly be worth forcing us all to revisit in more than one game. Descent has never felt more colourful. It's never felt more young. One of the characters who joins your party is a literal cat boy, which initially bothered me in a world of classic fantasy, but then I simply removed the two foot long stick from my rectum and realised that actually this cat boy was my favourite character to play, well tied for my favourite character, along with the elf who's both deaf and just really rude all the time. And at the same time that you're realizing these characters are actually pretty fun. I mean, that is, unless you're playing on a phone. I'm hoping that Baroness Andalyn will let me study her Alerions. You'll be having similar realizations about how much this app can bring to an adventure. As you get back to town, you'll be able to craft new components for your weapons that you can slot in before a scenario, so that when you enter your attacks into the app, 10% of the time you might do double damage, as if you were playing a gory, dweeby scratch card. Each hero even has these little achievement bars known as feats that you can fill up as you play, as if you were playing a mobile game, which I guess you kind of are. This feat system actually led to the funniest moment in my entire campaign, which was I just completed a feat, I was excited to see my next one, and the app said, new feat, interact with a well, which is both gloriously absurd and like a Shakespearean insult. Um, but listen, uh, can I be candid with you for a second? Do you want a tea? Ooh, how do you take yours? Five sugars! That's obviously, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. So, listen, I had a genuine crisis of confidence while reviewing this. I played it for an entire day, and then for an entire other evening, and I had the strangest feeling. I just didn't know how I felt. I had this growing sense of ownership over the characters that I'd play multiple times. I'd feel this flutter of possibility in my chest when I got a new weapon or a new skill. But if the act of writing a review for Shut Up and Sit Down is normally like tipping a jug and all of these like opinions and criticisms fall out, in this case that jug was empty, except for a few observational nuggets like the miniatures are nice and the app does some cool stuff. And then it was on my fourth evening with Descent that me and my friends were in a scenario and we kicked open the next door and the app said, put out tile 16B, put this furniture here, this furniture here, this monster here. And I just felt this wave of relief coming over me because that was when I realized that the reason I didn't have thoughts on this game is because there's almost no game to have thoughts on. Now, I know, I know, that's gonna sound absurd to those of you who've already bought this game and are already enjoying the campaign, but just hear me out. From my perspective, Legends of the Dark is a collection of elements familiar to the dungeon crawl genre that come together in this expensive euphony that distracts you from the hard fact that the mechanical side of this game, you know, positioning on the grid, managing your character, learning about monster AI in the app, what you're doing is less of a game and more of a process. Listen, on harder difficulty settings, you cannot make a mistake in these scenarios but after about three or four evenings, I could not make a mistake with my eyes closed and I was bored to tears. Look, I promised myself I wasn't gonna bang on about older versions of Descent in this video, but there's a point to be made here. The reason that Descent had this big grid in the middle of the table was that it was the game. It was full of monsters that kept coming back if you killed them, and the heroes were asking themselves, okay, how do we cross this dungeon as quickly and as safely as possible? And when I was reviewing this game, I was so fixated on what the app adds that I didn't notice that now, even though you want to be looking at all of this, it feels like this gaudy irrelevance and it's simply not where the game resides. For all of the terrific variety of this game's scenarios, whether you're in a thieves forest or a dwarven gulch, you're gonna enter a room. You're gonna painstakingly assemble that room. There will be some monsters. And listen, the monsters are dangerous. You need to kill them immediately. So you kill them and then you take as much time as you need before opening the next door. 
And so, you might draw the logical conclusion that, okay, they've removed this whole game where we have to run past monsters or wall them off or watch our lines of sight, but we have all this, this new system, this interactive 3D terrain. So maybe in combat we'll hit monsters and then interact with terrain that will help us to hit the monsters better? Nope! Look, there's probably some alternate universe where this game saw players doing attack and then dashing over to flip a cauldron of oil at enemies, or fleeing an enemy and then pushing a bookshelf in front of the door. Or even deciding that rather than attacking, you instead flip a card so that you can heal your friend. But that's not what this game is. Interacting with scenery mostly gets you loot, so you do that once all the monsters are dead. And flipping a card will make your character better often, but it's rarely better than just attacking. Which means that Descent Legends in the Dark is a game of finding a monster, walking up to it, and spending your turn hitting it twice until it dies. And suddenly all of those colourful, diverse characters in your party don't seem quite so colourful or diverse anymore. I am Galadin, the Elven Huntsman. With my hunter's bow and flashing swords, I hit enemies twice a turn until they're dead. I'm Cyrus, the Mage. Don't mess with my magical bird or magical wand. If you do, I'll use either one twice a turn until you're dead. Meow, I'm Chance, the cat burglar. Do we need to do this bit again? No. Stop there, I reckon. I understand. As the campaign goes on, of course, it does get more complicated. It introduces more equipment for your characters to divvy up and new skills. But all this really meant for me and my group is that we would work out what the most efficient arrangement of our tableau was to do the most damage per second, and then make sure all the cards were just right way up before we went through a door, as if we were straightening our ties before entering a meeting in a day that was all meetings. And once I realized how bored I was by this combat, the whole, well, almost the whole experience unraveled. I still really liked finding out more about these characters, and I did like unlocking new stuff, but I just felt like the game was sticking more candy and cherries into a dishwater-flavored sundae. And I think, probably, for the people online who are enjoying this game with all of its video gamey elements, are enjoying it kind of like a humdrum video game, where you can just kind of amiably drift through it with repetition becoming pleasant routine. But for me, no, it wasn't that at all. Because if this is a video game, it's one where I am both the player and the console. I'm a human loading bar having to render every monster and get every bandit out of its plastic. And then where does it go? Where does it go? Here? Okay, loading complete. Have fun. Oh, that's me again! I guess I'll, uh, what should I do? Oh yeah, walk up to it and attack twice! Do you want a capsule review of Descent Legends in the Dark? It's that by my fourth evening with this game, I was just hoping that whatever was on the other side of this door, it wasn't going to be stairs. Because if there's stairs, then you have to use pillars to create higher levels, and none of this has an effect on the game anyway. Picture me literally putting off a quest on the world's map that was set in a wizard's tower, because, you know, it's a wizard's tower, it's gonna have loads of stairs. I wasn't role-playing an elven ranger, I was role-playing a courier who did not want to deliver to a place with stairs. And did I mention that this version of Descent costs 120 elven croins? I don't think that's actually a lot of money if you're gonna enjoy the full 40-hour campaign, but I do think it's a lot of money for a game that you're not sure you're gonna love. And for me, I certainly didn't love it. I went on about four dates with it and decided I was done. I mean, if we're gonna extend this analogy, I decided that I really liked their friends, but I didn't like how they kept making me go into a dungeon. Not because I've got anything against dungeons, but rather what they did to me in the dungeon displayed a certain lack of expertise. So, no, I don't want to play this game again. Especially not after I had to transport this game to my friend's house a couple of times. Hey, board game publishers! Stop making games that come in cubes! Not all of us have cars, and if you don't have a car, these games don't fit in bags. And then you have to walk around town looking like a bloody video game protagonist who's midway through solving a block puzzle. But on the subject of shame, I do feel a deep shame to be sat in front of all of these stunning miniatures. This thrillingly vertiginous scenery that my wife kept calling a playset and I didn't even mind because she was right. Uh, and I feel this shame because, like, look at it! 
Look at it all. This should be enough for me. How is all of this not enough for me? But I'll tell you why. It's not enough for me because the actual design of this game sees me spending more time assembling each room and placing all the monsters than I ever do thinking about, like, how to fight the monsters. This design and being so beautiful and so lacking in a, in a game is like a heaving banquet table covered in dishes to try, and I know all of them have no salt and no sugar. I can return to a character I haven't played in weeks and equip them with a new sword and be fighting a new enemy and I can be doing it next to a cliff edge in the dream of someone else in the party. But I'm still just gonna be walking up and attacking them twice until they die and then going into the next room. Take tile 17B. Okay. Take one arch. Ah. Take one bookshelf. Take one stair. Ah, I'm gonna flip my biscuits! Oh, so what do you reckon? You think we need to do alternative recommendations in this review? I think we do. I think I've been quite mean. If you're in the mood for cooperative fantasy adventure, I would be foolish not to mention Gloomhaven or the upcoming sequel, Frosthaven. As crunchy and complicated as Descent is breezy, Gloomhaven has combat so good you keep thinking about it after the game is over, as opposed to Legends in the Dark, where you barely need to think about the combat while it's happening. And if you can handle the extra rules that are in Gloomhaven, it's also the cheaper and longer game. Alternatively, if you like the sound of almost all of these mechanics, but for half the price, and I feel really cheeky saying this, but Descent 2nd Edition still has stock available. That game now also has an app that lets you play it totally cooperatively, or you can try my favorite mode, the All vs. One campaign. But only do that if you're willing to suffer the slings and arrows of players getting real grumpy at one another over a rules dispute. So yeah, while this game wasn't for me, I am no less excited to try the next game that comes with a companion app. And not for nothing, if your group of friends doesn't have anybody who wants to be a dungeon master, I think it's really cool that a screen can step in and play that role for you. Which is why, I am very excited to announce this, Shut Up and Sit Down is releasing a new app for when you don't have a friend who wants to be a dungeon master, and in fact, you don't want to go into a dungeon at all. I'd like to introduce Shut Up and Sit Down, colon, Descent, colon, The Road to Becoming a Legend in the Dark. But I do have an early beta, so I believe that I can just set these two running, and I can go to the shops. Take care, everybody. You are in a cursed bog. There is a tree. There is some imps. I move and attack twice. The tree is dead. Search the tree. You receive 900 mosses and two bones. Okay, he's gone. We don't have to do this anymore. You enter the next room. No. Take tile 7A. No. There is a chest. No. There is a well. Oh, I actually have a feat to interact with a well. Well, well, well. Ha 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 ha